Hi everyone, welcome. My name is Alicia DeMesa and I am a Storytelling and Communications Leader for Sustainability and Technology and a Senior Global Futures Scholar for the Julianne Wrigley Global Futures Laboratory at Arizona State University. I am so very happy to be here today with all of you and with our speakers representing the sectors of eco building, waste, recycling and circular economy, mobility and impact and ESG reporting. On the subject of echo building, our expert speakers today are Anton Martins, business developer of BC Materials based in Brussels, Sebastian Moreno Baca, principal architect and founder of A2M Architecture Firm. On the subjects of waste, recycling, and circular economy, we will be engaging with Ingrid Nollet, sustainability manager for Shape, a Brussels based startup focused on technology intelligence to prevent water loss in buildings, and Gary Ashburner. General Manager Europe for AMP Robotics, an American company reimagining waste and recycling through artificial intelligence. On the subject of mobility, we have William Assenmacher, Associate at Labbox St Startup Incubator, and John Rassant, CEO of Commotion, a mobility conference based in the US and expanding around the world. And Shula Chowdhury, founder and CEO of Symmetrica, will talk about her AI-based technology startup focused on the future of impact and ESG reporting. And finally, we have Isabel Gripa, CEO of Hub Brussels, Brussels Economic Development Agency. We would like to thank Hub Brussels, the Brussels Economic Development Agency, for the opportunity to explore these topics and take away what entrepreneurs, corporations, and policymakers can learn about future trends in each of these sectors. So, let's get started. Our first segment is about the future of echo building. Echo building is a practice of building new and retrofitting older residential and commercial buildings in ways that are less harmful to the environment. It's a practice that's been around for many years now and presents new and exciting opportunities for builders, com companies, and policymakers. We're here with Anton Martins, business developer of BC Materials based in Brussels, and Sebastian Moreno Baca, principal architect and founder of ATM architecture firm. Anton Martins. Hey, Anton, welcome. Hello, Alicia. Uh, thanks for having me. Thanks for inviting me. Thank you. Well, hey, we want to start with asking our very first question. Your company describes itself as a circular materials company. And so how has a new focus on the circular economy impacted your company's vision for the future of materials building? What do you think? Well, at BC Materials, we transform excavated earth, which is officially considered as a waste. Uh, we turn it into uh, circular building materials. And we think it's really the basics of circular economy that you more valorize what you have or what you consider a waste and transform it into a building material and in light of the climate challenge i think it's a very very big issue because uh, we in this linear economy we usually import a lot of materials that are co2 intensive and then we kind of depose of them really far away from the cities but there's also a different way of working you reuse what is present in your city by transforming excavated earth for example into building materials and you apply it and integrate it into the buildings of uh, of the city directly that's great and that's our approach the, and and it's it's amazing work that you're all doing so i want to ask you a question you know recently Economist Impact published a report that featured alternative building materials as one of the 12 technology solutions to decarbonize cities. Given that alternatives to cement and concrete score high on impact, very high on scalability, and low on cost of investment, you know, what do you think? Will we see materials, technologies, and business models like BC Materials more in the future? And also, what do you think would take to make this really more mainstream as a business model? Yeah, definitely, because I think the, the crazy part is for the last uh, two decades, we've been very busy in construction with making the perfect energy efficient building. And it's really now it's 
pretty mainstream to make a, a well isolated uh, building with 100% renewable energy. Mm -hmm. But decarbonizing the materials is a new challenge and physically and technically for some a bit more difficult. Mm -hmm. And in that sense, a lot of uh, low carbon materials such as uh, compressed earth blocks, uh, ram dirt or, 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 or clay plasters that we make are very good alternatives and are actually more healthy than the other materials. So the scaling at some point will go very fast and we've already like quadrupled our uh, revenue for, for over the last three years as a young startup. That's not bad. It's not, wow, it's not Tesla style, obviously, but we're doing, uh, we're doing a very good job. And I think uh, more and more investors see that this is really a point of focus that we not only have to decarbonize energy, but also the material flow. And the more circular your material is, the more that it can be reused, the more that it's easy to access and tap into, the better the, the, the business case, obviously. That's fantastic. Now, you are a Brussels startup, born and bred, really, right, as a company. Yep. And so, you know, what is it like being a, a Brussels-based uh, startup company in this, this sector? And also, you know, how do you look to, how, how do partners and collaborators, collaborators, whether it's from Br Brussels or internationally, how does that help all of you? Well, we feel a bit spoiled in Brussels because there are a lot of opportunities created by the region, both in, in investment subsidies, in initial subsidies. We have space. We, we, we rent a terrain here, 1,200 meters in the port of Brussels at a very uh, reasonable price because obviously producing building materials is quite costly in infrastructure and in space. And so you need a kind of initial uh, pre-investment to get started because it's a bit uh, David versus Goliath uh, fight. Mm -hmm. uh, the concrete producers are very big. So you need a kind of ecosystem. And for example, uh, A2M, the, the company of uh, Sebastian Moreno, also passed by here to do workshops. And you feel a kind of ecosystem where a lot of architects know what the challenges are and that together we're building a new uh, uh, system where bio-based materials and very, very low carbon materials can be combined and actually create better health effects for those who live and work in these spaces. Yeah, that's great. So we have this win-win situation of public health exactly. and decarbonization and lower costs and environmentally friendly and everything else. Well, thank you for bringing up Sebastian Moreno because next we have Sebastian Moreno Baca. So Sebastian and A2M are well known for passive building projects in Belgium and Europe with projects such as the Belgian Embassy in Kinshasa, I'm sorry if I said that wrong, Kinshasa, and the renovation of the iconic head office of ING Marnix into a CO2, a carbon neutral building. So Sebastian, welcome. And I wanna ask you, you know, as climate change, extreme heat and weather events are accelerating and water is becoming more scarce and a challenge for really most of the cities around the world, what is the opportunity for regenerative building practices? And before you even go there, can you tell us all, what's the difference between passive and regenerative building? Yeah, hi, Alicia. Well, thank you also to welcome me. And also thank you, Anton, because uh, he's one of the best, I think, uh, in material resources solution. Um, so as you said, Alicia, uh, we discovered that to make passive house building, which going to have like a heating and cooling demand reduce up to 10%, so it's 90% savings. We discover it's only actually a first step and we can go way more beyond if you take into account embodied energy, uh, uh, greenery and so on, and also the water strategies and so on, up to the point that you can go to not only uh, have a project that's going to limit the impact on the environment, but you can even regenerate it means that it goes beyond. If you don't do the development, it's worse for the planet. Mm -hmm. Well put, well put. And and so um, when you're looking at the what has been happening in Brussels in particular, how has Brussels actually shaped this transition from you know the passive building into the regenerative building? And can you tell us more about that? Yeah, actually it all happened a few years ago when uh, passive house became mandatory. Um, so it's it's a uh, actually it is the first region in the world where uh, such a law has been voted and it came into effect in 2015. And uh, what we discovered also it was uh, very very funny 
is that actually uh, nothing stopped there and we go now even beyond. And that happens also with real estate developers. So we have some clients, you know, because we have also an office in, in New York. And even when you, we do development with Belgian developers out of Belgium or, or out of Europe, the idea is to bring this kind of uh, know-how, very pragmatic know-how, and, uh, and try to go as far as we can, not only to passive house or energy, very uh, small use, but even to go beyond. That's really the idea. Mm -hmm. And you know, we have that small development in, in Arizona also, mm -hmm. where we try to do a kind of a small district that's going to be completely self-sufficient and, of course, CO2 neutral, but at the cost as uh, business as usual. That's the idea, of course. Right. So for, for most people, they don't know the town of Eloy, Arizona, which is a very, very small little town in the south part of Arizona. So tell me about that. What do you think? Well, first of all, maybe you can tell everyone a little bit about the unique challenges of Eloy, Arizona and doing this project there. But also, what do you think that the Eloy project has to teach both Europeans and Americans about uh, this type of a, a project and eco building trends in general? Yeah, you're right. So Arizona has, we have really extreme condition because it's very, very dry, of course, very hot. You had more than 110 and 15 degrees last year, mm -hmm. uh, Fahrenheit or 55 Celsius if you want. And we have also a lack of water, you know that. Um, so the funny thing is, it's a development that we study for uh, uh, Luxembourg developers. In Luxembourg is like Belgium, so we are alike about uh, energy and so on. Uh, so you wanted to show that, okay, if it's possible to do such a development, we're going to uh, be self-sufficient not only in energy but also in water and you can do that in Arizona in the desert mm -hmm. it means that everywhere else in the world it's nothing it's too easy and it was really a big challenge we even uh, one of the solutions came out of one of uh, Arizona startup you know where they use even vapor in the air mm -hmm. um, to, to have a third what we need of uh, water so that that's the idea to work in this extreme condition and the rest of the world Come on, that's nothing. That's great. Well, thank you so much to both of you. And thank you for all of your thoughts and being with us. Likewise. You're welcome. Take care. In our next segment, we will explore the future of waste, recycling, and circular economy, and how emerging technologies are changing these industries. With us now are Ingrid Nolle, Sustainability Manager for SHAPE, which is a Brussels-based startup focused on technology intelligence to prevent water loss in buildings. And we also have Gary Ashburner, General Manager Europe of Amp Robotics, an American, an American company reimagining waste through artificial intelligence. Ingrid, good to see you. Gary, good to see you. And Ingrid, I want to start with you. So tell me, how is your company marrying the precision of technology data with water loss prevention? And how do you see emerging technologies changing the landscape of water efficiency and resource control? Hello, nice to meet you again. Uh, yeah, so what I can say is uh, what's the situation today and how we can improve it, of course, because uh, water shortages are becoming more and more frequent. And this is due to uh, climate change, population growth and pollution. A lot of regions, as uh, Sebastian said before, are facing now water scarcity. But what people just forget is that water Water is a resource, uh, it's the lifeblood of our economy and the lifeblood of our environment. So we must reduce water by uh, reducing the water demand and eliminating we waste and leakages in buildings that are so-called the customer side leakages are uh, more effective and uh, much easier than changing the behavior of the people. That's great. Well, you know, it's it's really interesting that a lot of times we, everyone talks about how scarce water is, right? And yet, this is probably one of those things that we tend to overlook altogether. And so, shape taking technology into this realm for efficiencies is something that is truly innovative. I want to ask you, you know, what do you see as other opportunities for this kind of technology, whether it's within water efficiency or, en or energy or something else? Yeah, so 
as you say, that water and uh, innovation and technology they are really uh, playing a major role in the um, in the sector today, and because they are changing how we see the scarcity, the water efficiency, uh, the utility also operation, and all these kind of uh, informa information that we get are improving our data analytics. So this is what makes the impact. Um, technologies for us, they must be really scalable and effective. This is how we can improve what's happening today with our climate. And we developed a technology like that. So uh, regardless, uh, I will maybe explain that we are uh, addressing the building sector at SHAPE. So we are talking about drinkable water. Uh, this is the resource that we want to save. And at SHAPE, we address so um, public and private building because there is where we can make the difference. 70% uh, of the drinkable water is used in the building sector. So by addressing leaks and waste, we can uh, actually save water and save time for the people that are doing the maintenance of the, of the buildings. And so we started uh, with one thought is, okay, using the existing water meter as the unique measuring point, uh, we can collect all the data that is needed to uh, detect leaks in real time. And any type of building can be equipped super easily, quickly, and in a few days. So this is how we make the change. And uh, regarding the opportunities, I would say that there are two major opportunities today. There's what's happening in the municipalities, but also what's happening in the water uh, utilities uh, in water scarce region. Uh, municipal municipalities, uh, their big challenge is that they are facing a lot of um, price increases because they made a, a lot of investment in to improve their infrastructures. Mm -hmm. And so it's also a political demand here that we want to address. Uh, it's to propose better services for people and organizations so they can also manage better their costs. And energy is one of the main factors. We, we, we can do it the same way for gas and electricity. But water is just the next one on the list. And this is why we have to act now. Fantastic. Thank you, Ingrid. I want to turn to Gary. Gary, you know, Amp Robotics is already a leader in machine learning, AI, and robotics for waste recycling. How do you see emerging technologies changing the landscape of recycling and waste as we know it? Hello, Alicia, everybody. Thank you very much for inviting me. Um, yeah, um, at Amp Robotics, we, we are, um, I think, quite unique. Uh, we only design and manufacture robots. We don't uh, provide services for the other recycling facilities. Um, the a robot will do whatever a robot is told to do. And the unique um, secret source, I suppose, is the aspect of telling it what to do, which is where the AI comes in. Mm -hmm. um, we at AMP are privileged. We have the largest deployed fleet of robots in the world. Um, each one of these robots are learning from each other every second of the minute, every minute of the hour, every hour of the day. Uh, we have over 10 billion items that we're recognizing going through our systems. And that's really one of the keys. And in terms of how it's changing the industry, if you imagine all your household waste uh, being put through various machines at the front end and then being cleaned and, and actually picked out by humans at the back end so that what we call bales, which is the compressed material, mm -hmm. has a residual value. Anything that could be worth money, like uh, clear PET, your, your water bottles or, or Coke cans, for example, is sorted by machines, but then individually by humans and that's a very dangerous job mm -hmm. humans don't like to do it it's it's that there's hygiene issues you can get uh, health and safety issues to do with being punctured by hypodermic needles and generally the pay is very low so if you don't have a human sort to turn up your machine uh, still is processing waste mm -hmm. and your purity of your material is low so you don't get as much money for it in addition a human can pick typically 25 to 40 picks per minute. A robot can do that double superhuman speed. So the throughput of the um, facility can be improved. Hence, the profit for the organization can be improved. And also can the purity of the bale. So we're getting better quality material. We're throwing less material into landfill, which is only a good thing. 
That's fantastic. And and tell us, you know, these days we have, well, for, for the last couple of years, we've been hearing lots and lots of challenges with the global markets in China in particular, and all these changes that are happening. So within the global market changes, what are the challenges for recycled waste? You know, are, is, are, how are these challenges providing new opportunities for companies to capture in the future? What do you think about that? Sure. Well, um, uh, you're exactly right, Alicia. What we can't do now is just dump all our rubbish into other countries. Mm -hmm. it's, it's illegal and other countries are stopping that. And quite right. We now have to deal with it ourselves. Uh, and that brings a challenge for the governments, not only just for individual companies, but it also presents opportunities. Um, there's also a groundswell from people who want to use recyclable material. And legislation uh, from governments has, has started to drive companies' behaviour. Um, so plastic tax, for example, is evident uh, in a few countries where if the producers of the bottles, for example, that you drink from in water um, aren't 30% um, used from recycle it, then they get taxed. Mm -hmm. So there's a big driver. Uh, in addition, nobody can do the job. So there's a real human shortage. And importantly, what that data, what the uh, legislation is also driving is data what is actually being recycled? How do I know where my material is? And that thirst for data in the industry is driving opportunities for AI information, not just robotics. Yes, very much so. Well, let me ask you, last thoughts. Do you have any advice for companies who are looking to invest in the waste and recycling industry? Sure. So um, data is the key. A robot will do whatever it's told to do. And robots are very, very good at actually doing very repetitive tasks. So you all may know that most of your food is probably packed by a robot. So they pick up the, big, you know, the, the Oreo biscuits and put them into the packet, and then they might seal the packet. Um, the key here is what is that robot seeing and how is it characterizing or identifying that material that needs to be picked and either put into a bale for recycling or uh, in any area that you want to, so metal, uh, plastics, etc. Mm -hmm. So the key data is how big is the network? What can that robot see? And always look for organizations that have a very large network of identification of materials. Also, you need local support. Um, you need engineering teams locally, and you need to know that that artificial intelligence software is being developed within that organization as opposed to being subcontracted, because then you have all sorts of issues of time scale and, and less flexibility. Well, we look very forward to hearing and seeing what Shape and what Amprobotics does next. And Ingrid and Gary, thank you so much. Thank, thank you. you. Let's look at the future of mobility. Transportation as we know it today may become a relic of the past more quickly than we possibly realize. There are pundits around the world who advocate for transportation becoming more accessible, affordable, and of course sustainable. The three disrupted trends of electrification of vehicles, connected autonomous vehicles, and mobility as a service have many countries and companies researching and developing ways forward to change transportation as we know it. The future of mobility is changing rapidly and the global automobile industry is already set to move away from fossil fuel to electric vehicles by the close of the decade. In the United States, President Joe Biden signed an executive order in August 2021 that sets an ambitious new target to make half of all new vehicles sold in 2030 zero emissions vehicles. We have with us right now William Ossemacher associate at Labbox Startup Incubator, and John Rassant, CEO of Commotion, a mobility conference based in the U.S. and expanding around the world to talk about the future of mobility. So, William, I want to start with you. Can you talk to us about how startups contribute to the future of urban mobility and electric vehicles in Europe? Yes. Um, hi, Alicia. Thank you. Thank you very much for having me today. Um, so, with pleasure. Um, so, so first of all, it's it's important to understand that um, 
the mobility is not a topic that you can solve within silos. You really need to 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 involve all the stakeholders to to take into account their opinion, to take the, the into account the opinion of governments, of OEMs, of customers, and so on, in order to find the right solution that will change mobility, that will that will make mobility more smooth, more sustainable, and so on. And therefore, you really need to understand the context in which you need to uh, implement. Um, uh, the, the, uh, of the region where you need to implement solutions, um, and therefore I first wanted to 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 um, give you some some contextual information about Belgium and and, and Brussels and how how we see the le the, the the changes of mobility to uh, to be driven in the future. Yes, please um, do. And and so um, we. Um, at Labbox, we it's it, well. It's firstly very important to understand that in Belgium, and and I think it also applies to other country, other countries in Europe, mm -hmm. is that mobility benefits from a very fiscal um, uh, advantageous regime. So it means that it's very uh, advantageous for employers to pay for the mobility of the employees. And and so you have, for instance, lots of employees in Belgium paying for the um, car. Of their of the employees for the uh, public transport abonement um, for uh, mobility budget and so on, and the reason is that it's more it's fiscally very interesting for them to pay for that instead of giving them cash, and this seems quite not not a big deal, but ultimately it has a, a huge impact because it means that if you want to implement changes into the mobility sector in Belgium, well the first one to convince are the uh, employers and so it means that changes in mobility are driven by the by the employees and to understand a little bit where it's going to move you need to understand what are where employees or where corporates are expected to move in the future and therefore um, we see um, a massive trend into a new mobility sustainable mobility because corporates are more and more um, sensitive to ESG trends and they are they are looking for solution into the um into the the uh, the uh, sustainable and greener solutions great now um, lampbox is a big proponent of electric vehicles correct yes indeed um we we truly believe in the um adoption of uh, electric vehicles um, we uh, are owned by um, a company that is uh, the distributors of the Volkswagen Group, mm -hmm. uh, and Volkswagen has massively invested and, and is well positioned currently to um, to to uh, to take a leading role in the in the transition to uh, electric vehicles. And we see um, from that lots of opportunities for startups. We have, for instance, in our portfolio, a startups that. Um, sells uh, EV chargers, EV chargers for public solutions, but available for private solutions. And we believe that this is only a first step into the um, into the, uh, the 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 solution that 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 needs to change. So basically, um, we believe that that a, a, a vehicle is expected to change the entire conception of electricity of households. And we believe that having an electric vehicle will, will implement massive changes of consumers towards more sustainable solutions. For instance, if you take a, a normal household, um, just by having one electric vehicle, they are expected to double the consumption of electricity. This means that it improved the business case of solar panels, for instance, because when you have solar panels, um, you reduce massively your cost of uh, energy consumption. And so it means that um, basically um, you, you uh, well, 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 you reduce the cost of ownership of having a car by just um, moving towards electri electrification. So William, you know, when it comes to the challenges and the opportunities that are becoming apparent because we have EV and, and let's call it the ecosystem of e EV, all these different services, products, industries that are becoming associated with this space, what do you think are th both the challenges and the opportunities for companies who are looking into the realm of EV? Um. Yeah, that's a very good question. I think that um, on on the challenges side, in the short term, I think that uh, the biggest one will be on the sequences of of uh, investment required. 
Uh, take, for instance, the public charging. Um, the, the, the companies investing in, in, in those solutions um, could ask themselves, should I first wait for the adoptions of, um, of, of a, 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 a higher EV penetration um, before investing in new solution? Or should I first invest in new solution, in, in charging solution, public charging solutions, um, in order to incentivize people to move into a, a EV um, uh, to, to, to incentivize them to uh, adopt a new EV. Um, and so, and so but, but I believe that in the long term, those challenges won't, won't exist anymore. You can still imagine having the challenge of, of energy supply because th those energy and mobility will be very, very linked. And you could imagine having like an overconsumption of energy. But I think that at the same time, um, it also creates an opportunity for, for cross-selling of when you sell, for instance, uh, EV chargers, well, you combine this with um, uh, PV, P, uh, solar panels um, in, in order to make like the, the, uh, the consumption of cars even greener than it is already. Um, so that's, that's one opportunity. And then we see like lots of opportunity to improve the charging of, of those cars. We see lots of opportunity to reduce also the, um, the, the number of cars of households and to, to uh, incentivize people to use share cars um, that, that are expected to move also like the, the, uh, the car sharing solutions are also expected to move towards um, uh, 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 electrical, el electrical cars. And um, this also creates then additional um, business models for startups. I'm thinking, for instance, on, at, at, for instance, mobile charging solutions, having like, uh, instead of having the cars going to a charger to charge, you might imagine that you have like a truck that is going to charge all the car sharing, uh, the, 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 the fleet of, of uh, cars shared. Good. Well, thank you so much, William. And John, I want to turn to you because you're also in the mobility futures space. And so, you know, my question for you is, I believe that you happen to be a proponent of hydrogen, are you not? And how is hydrogen fitting into this equation based off of what William was also talking about with electric vehicles? Well, I think, um, I think what William was talking about was really about cars. And, you know, mobility is broader than just cars. Uh, it, mobility is, is, if you think about mobility, is moving people and goods around. It can be trucks, it can be uh, trains, et cetera. It's also important. You know, if you think about the mobility sector as a whole, it uh, represents about 25% of all global carbon emissions. So it's very important that we begin to decarbonize this. We cannot do it only by electricity only by uh, EVs. Um, and why is that? We why have why to bring not? Hydrogen into the because the stress on the grid will be so massive that I really worry about some of those consequences. And, and uh, I'm an American speaking from Miami outside here. Uh, and, you know, our utilities and our grid system in the United States will be very hard pressed to cope with this tsunami of electric vehicles that's coming on the market. Mm -hmm. So I, I am a bit worried about that. Um, and uh, so hydrogen is a very, very, very interesting fuel, particularly for uh, trucks, for trains, for aviation. And I think that's where we're going to see a lot of, uh, of movement in coming years. The technology is sort of almost there, um, but it will get there. And it's, a, you know, there's the, the great thing about renewable hydrogen is that it's, it is fully renewable. Uh, it doesn't produce any carbon. Uh, it's, Hydrogen is the most abundant element in the universe, as, as anybody who's taken a chemistry course knows. So uh, we're very uh, we're very bullish on that, and it's something, by the way, that's um, you know the North Sea, Belgium, the Netherlands, Germany are very hydrogen forward. Uh, the European Union uh, and particularly Germany and France in particular, but, but also Britain uh, and Italy uh, have announced a massive uh, multi-billion euro programs to support the green hydrogen sector. So that's very, very encouraging. That's fantastic. Well, I want to ask you, you know, for both of you, 
Your last thoughts on what, what is your advice for companies who are seeking to invest in uh, the mobility space, whether we're talking about the frontier of hydrogen or we're talking about the frontiers and, and the pioneering of uh, electrical vehicles and the ecosystems around both. So what, what advice would you have for companies and, and why would Brussels be an a advantageous place to, to come and to set up shop? Well, if I could have a quick go at that, um, uh, excuse me, William. No I think worries. Brussels is enormously attractive. I mean, for one, it's a big city. It's uh, about two and a half million people in greater Brussels. But if you think about the larger um, conurbation of Leuven and Antwerp, et cetera, it's, it's around five million people. So it's, it's a substantial city. Um, so that's important. It's a big market. The other thing is obvious. It's... Um, uh, and it was referred to earlier uh, in this emission, um, it's all of the European Union institutions. Um, it's very, very important to you know, be in the capital of Europe if you have a European strategy in terms of your go-to-market strategy. Um, I think the last thing that's super interesting, it's really often overlooked, um, is the sheer amount of innovation, that uh, technological innovation, that is taking place uh, in Belgium and in, in Europe in general, that I know, for example, that we as Americans can certainly benefit from and tap into. You know, one such space, for example, is a vehicle to grid technology um, so that your electric vehicle, whether, or whether it's a car or, or a bus or a truck, um, can return electricity to the grid um, at off-peak hours. Now, that's that's a really good uh, system. Um, it's not at all developed in the United States. I think it has to come. Mm -hmm. But that's something that I think there can be quite an interesting value exchange there. That's great. William, what do you think? Yeah, I, I, I fully agree um, with what Jen just said. Um, and, and, and if I had to add some, some element, I would firstly mention that... Um, um, Belgium is a very interesting um, ground for for uh, mobility innovation and startups. Um, firstly, because there is a there is a strong support from the from the government uh, towards new mobility. And as as Chen said in the beginning, mobility is not only related to cars. And you see uh, some 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 strong investment and strong incentives from the government to support new mobility solutions, such as. Um, um, uh, investment in infrastructure for bikes, uh, investment uh, in in in, um, in infrastructure for for um, uh, other types of mobility, such as micro mobility and so on. Mm -hmm. um, you see lots of incentives towards new mobility and alternative mobilities to cars. You have the 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 mob mobility budget that is made available for everyone, and that is a fiscal niche for all the companies that are willing to incentivize their, their employees to move towards uh, something else than, 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 than cars. So that's my first reason is that, uh, m m my first element is that you have a massive support from the government. Mm -hmm. Second element is um, the fact, the fact that, that Belgium is maybe a big, Brussels is maybe a big city, but ultimately when you compare, compare Belgium to other European countries, it's very tiny. And, and, and that's actually a good thing for startups because from day one, startups knows that at some point they will need to, interna to go internationally in order to scale. And that's very impor important in the mindset of entrepreneurs in Brussels because from day one, they know international is their objective. And to scale, to, to make them profitable and, and to become a huge startup, it's not enough to remain in Belgium. And so you have this mentality that from day one, everything needs to be set up to become an international company. So we, we prepare a website in English, French, Dutch, and, and, and so on. Um, so that's, that's very helpful for, for, for the internationalization phase that usually happens quite smoothly to, uh, for, for Belgian startups. And last element that was also mentioned earlier is the fact that Belgium is actually a mix between France and the Netherlands. And so on top of the Belgian investor, which are, which are quite um, 
quite significantly present in Belgium, we also benefit from very close link to the Netherlands and to France. So we can also attract very easily investors from those two countries and making making us like very propice to raise funds. And so those three elements on top of all the elements that were mentioned before are really important um, to, to uh, really advantageous um, uh, factors for, for, uh, for, for Belgian startups. Gentlemen, thank you so much for all of your thoughts. As a bonus segment, I am here with Anshula Chowdhury, founder and CEO of Symmetrica, an AI-based technology startup focused on ESG and impact reporting. So, Anshula, I am so happy that you're here with us and you have such a unique take on ESG reporting in particular and the use of AI with us. Can you tell us about the current challenges of impact and ESG reporting and how artificial intelligence is posed to solve these challenges? Yeah, for sure. Um, thanks for having me. Uh, thanks for starting with such a nice meaty question. Um, so I guess my first couple of thoughts here is like ESG and impact reporting is a very new space and everyone, and, um, everyone always says that, but I think what we really need to understand about that is that it's also a new data set for our species as a whole. I mean, we have very fragmented access to ESG and impact data. Um, the space is actually bringing all of this together into one uh, sort of location within enterprises. Um, and that's great. Uh, we also need to understand that the reason we haven't done this in the past is because today the scale of the problem uh, that we're trying to solve around climate change and wealth disparity, and we're seeing that now even with access to vaccines and um, and how that's really impacting everybody on the planet, regardless of what sort of income scale you're at, um, the scale of the problem is just huge. Um, and so we're still fighting with very fundamental questions about ESG, such as like what to measure, how to measure that, how to communicate any ESG and impact data, and yet there's a great deal of urgency. Uh, so the challenge is how to actually truly operationalize more ESG strategies mm -hmm. in what is fundamentally a siloed and chaotic space. Um, and so that's where AI comes in. And I, and I get really excited about this because um, we are figuring out a lot of things around ESG and impact. We're figuring out a lot of things around AI, but these two things can actually really work well together to, to resolve uh, the challenges that I just talked about. So um, firstly, we know that um, we can use knowledge representation, um, which is a substream of AI, to create data in a format that machines can understand and that we can actually do this with ESG and impact data. So that's uh, part of the work that I've actually done, um, as well as uh, working with colleagues like Dr. Mark Fox at the University of Toronto to help um, develop out um, basically an open source data format that can make ESG data understandable to machines. So once we start to do that, um, once ESG can be understood by a computer, this now opens up a whole new world where the fractured nature of ESG data starts to be improved. Um, data can be linked. Um, we can also find that even though people are using different language to talk about different concepts, that we can uh, still pool that data together for benchmarking and comparison. Mm -hmm. um, and so that's a really exciting sort of forefront of ESG. Um, and I think we're going to see a lot more uh, capabilities coming out um, around ESG and impact reporting linked to the fundamental sort of breakthrough of being able to get machines to understand ESG data and, and resolve some of those fracturing and silo uh, challenges. That's great. And, and you know, ESG reporting in general has this, this ethical framework, let's just call it, you know, just to the very concept of, of what it is. So, so talk to us also about how does, whether it's it, just by using AI or if it's very specifically the knowledge representation, really lends to a more ethical approach to uh, impact reporting and ESG reporting? Yeah, it's a great question. Um, so... When we talk about knowledge representation, it's a little bit different from um, machine learning where we have sort of, sort of heuristics um, and natural language pro processing, um, which is uh, really about like understanding the structure of language ultimately, um, and then eventually the content. Knowledge representation is different in that it is allowing for deductive reasoning uh, inside of a machine. And so some of the challenges that we see around the ethical use of AI, I believe can actually be resolved by 
um, making ESG and impact data understandable to a machine and using that knowledge representation layer. Because what we'd be able to do is have uh, machines uh, operating in situations where the rules are not clear because uh, humanity is messy and reality is messy right. um, and actually be able to apply deductive reasoning in those situations. So that's that's when I talk about, you know, where is the future of ESG and impact data? I think that's ultimately where it's going to get to right now. The challenge that the space is facing is how do we, um, you'll hear language like digitizing uh, impact data. It's all kind of related to this idea of we need to break down the information silos that exist um, and make the, the data understandable to each other and to the machines that we work with. Fantastic. Well, Anshula, last thought. You know, you're part. You're a, you're a founder. Uh, you have a startup company. What advice do you have for mature companies who are looking to invest in this space? Um, so I think uh, a lot of mature companies um, and scale ups are looking at ESG as both a risk and an opportunity. Um, and right now there's a lot of confusion about the proportions and the content of either of those two buckets. Um, so how big is the risk? How big is the opportunity? And then what does the risk and the opportunity actually look like? Um, and so I think a lot of larger companies that by the very nature of their size um, do have organizational um sort of standards and values that have gotten them to where they are. And uh, some of them do have ESG at the, the core and some, many of them do not. Mm -hmm. um, I think a lot of those CEOs and leaders are looking at a way at um, ESG as a way to just get capital in the door or to fend off issues around the social contract to operate. Right. Um, so it's absolutely true uh, that these realities are there um, and that they are driving ESG in a transactional way in the market, but they're not actually the core reason that ESG exists and they're not the only reason. So ultimately ESG is about how humans can um, exist on the planet mm -hmm. um, and with each other and within the physical environment. So um, with climate change, because that's an existential issue, um, that's just an example, but that's ultimately that level of urgency is what is driving ESG. Great. So, yeah, so I think like the the last thing I'll say on this is like the reality, if that's the reality about what's driving ESG, mm -hmm. then each company needs to be able to make a strategy decision on how to engage, um, either with ESG on the risk side or on the opportunity side, or most likely on a bit of both. Mm -hmm. But that strategy needs to start from an understanding that there's an urgency and impatience that's driving these changes. So um, as a whole, ESG is going to remain dynamic and chaotic until we come to a steady and sustainable state for how to um, deal with the, the challenges that humanity and the planet is facing at the moment. Um, and so that really needs to be rolled up in the strategy and it also needs to be rolled up in how you're gonna be measuring and reporting on ESG. Mm -hmm. So any large company in summary needs to really plan for chaos and to ensure that their ESG and impact reporting is going to be flexible to this very changing environment that is being driven by a lot of urgency. Those are very insightful words and, and much uh, good advice there. So thank you so much, Anshula, for being with us. Thank you to Hub Brussels, the Brussels Economic Development Agency, for the opportunity to learn more about the future of sustainable technologies. Um, I want to ask you know, both of you, Anton and Sebastian, do you have any advice for companies looking to invest in eco building and why would Brussels be a good place for that? And why would Brussels be a good place for companies to establish their presence? Uh, if, I, if I can answer first, I think uh, it's definitely a very good investment. I think it's an investment in the middle long term because the initial cost might be a bit higher. But once you take up uh, the new product and the new approach, I think you will have better returns on the long run. And that's really important because it's really a pioneering game where the, where the early bird gets the worm. And the worm is a bit uh, tough to swallow in the beginning, but then it will be really uh, a, a, a attraction that, that will come. Mm -hmm. And concerning Brussels, I think we have a very uh, interesting public here walking around, a lot of creative designers, a lot of uh, thoughtful people who have a lot of experience and, and, and intelligence in architecture, in building, in designing and very uh, pragmatic people too. I think we speak our languages, French, English, Dutch, uh, and some even others. Anche un po' in italiano, no? Uh, we could do it in Italian too, if you want. So 
Um, I think we have uh, uh, cheap spaces in comparison to Amsterdam, uh, Berlin and Paris, mm -hmm. uh, and it creates uh, an energy that is attractive to a lot of people and that makes it, um, that makes it nice to, to stick around here. We hear a lot of people Sometimes in the beginning, they find Brussels a bit chaotic. It is a, a different city than, than others that are a bit more easy to catch. Mm -hmm. But once they, 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 they get the hang of it, they, they really fall in love with the city. And I think that for investors, uh, it could be the same thing. That's great. Sebastian, any, any other thoughts to add to Anton's? Yeah, I, I would even add on what Anton said. Huh? The, the nice thing, what you have in Brussels, and it's very different than uh, the other capitals in Europe, is that because of the scale and uh, it's so multilingual, multicultural, is that you can uh, go very far. It's a small laboratory at almost no risk, and we can go so far. So it 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 all happens somewhere. It starts somewhere in, in Sweden, Germany, and so on. But it's always in Brussels where you could find passive house building, super sexy in design with negative extra cost. So you see there's so many pragmatic uh, elements and this is not uh, for nothing that, for example, the, the former mayor of New York and uh, the same in Vancouver, the former mayor, they took uh, the Brussels uh, exemplary building program to use it and try to implement it mm -hmm. in-house. And we see that a bit all over, all over the world now that, of course, if you could do it in Brussels, everywhere else, okay, there's no risk because we've done it, you see. This is why it's very um, unrisky and, and very safe place to go and to invest. Ingrid, I want to ask you, what do you think about Brussels as a place for companies to establish a presence? So what, what's the advantage of, of establishing a presence here in Brussels? So I would say first that Anton and Sebastian answered very nicely to this question before and gave a lot of arguments to come and join us here in Brussels. But of course, as they said, Brussels is a multicultural city. There's a lot of diversity and it's really attractive. I would add that uh, it's also super close to the um, EU institution. And so if you want to act on climate change, if you want to address uh, problematics in public buildings, you have to talk to governments, you have to talk to um, parliamentarians, and you have to act as a lobbyist in your communication, uh, especially relating to emerging technologies and sustainability and education. I think this is key. Um, there's a lot of talent also in Brussels. We have a, a big team here from 25 persons and they come from a lot of different countries, but they just want to work here in Brussels. So that's quite uh, something also. And as uh, the, there was also mentioned, it's a lab of innovation because people here the Belgian people, they don't uh, fear about taking initiative and to uh, fail and then to start over again. So it's an excellent lab for innovation and to, for test and learn. And uh, at least I would say there is a, a lot of investment opportunities too. Uh, we have nice and really talented coaches. Uh, we have the business angels community. So I think for startups and for other investment opportunities from uh, companies that are coming from abroad it's um it's quite an experience and here you are allowed to 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 test and try and learn again we've covered a lot of ground today how do we sum up all of the highlights well here is your trends recap number one in echo building we discuss market opportunities to new low-tech and high-tech building materials and discuss building design that is not only passive and carbon neutral, but also regenerative to the environment. We know that the fight against global warming invites us to reintegrate nature into the design of our cities and that this will undoubtedly change the future of our Thank cities. You, but in this, it provides an innovative opportunities for creative entrepreneurs, architects, builders, and other investors. Number two in waste, recycling, and circular economy. Natural resources and raw materials are becoming scarcer and more precious. And at the same time, carbon neutral economies are needed worldwide. Today's entrepreneurs are moving away from a linear economy to a circular economy and cradle to cradle supply chains, where waste becomes a usable resource once again.
This global challenge also brings immense opportunities for technology companies, since it's clear that the prevention of waste and the reuse of waste will involve the use of things like the Internet of Things, data management, robotics, artificial intelligence, machine learning. The cities that position themselves at the forefront of these developments will be those that offer the most realized innovation. And number three, in mobility and transportation, several trends are combining on the future of mobility. First, there is, of course, the progressive abandonment of fossil fuels to propel our cars in favor of electric cars, scooters, or bicycles. And all of this has infrastructure challenges, such as the supply of charging stations, management of electricity production, etc. But more than likely, EV will not be the only solution. If we go beyond cars and we have to, you know, untask our grid, the hydrogen engine has a huge potential, and hydrogen as a fuel has a huge potential for heavy-duty vehicles and maritime transportation. We can also observe that the change is not only technological, but also resides in the uses and new business models of shared vehicles. Finally, we can feel the rise of mobility as a service, fully integrated, and of course, Brussels is an innovation hub in all of this area. If you're interested in receiving an advanced copy of the ebook, What's Next in Sustainable Tech for a Better World, we invite you to subscribe to the link you see here below. You'll also get some really great infographics. Click now for yours. We've heard a lot of great insights from our speakers about the future of sustainable technologies. And here with us now is Isabel Gripa. She is the CEO of Hub Brussels, Brussels Economic Development Agency. Isabel, it is great to see you. And uh, tell us, what do you think about all of our speakers for this talk? And what are some of your own conclusions? Thank you, Alicia. And first of all, I would like to say how oh, happy I am to see and to hear so many entrepreneurs took the time to share their thoughts, their vision, and their expertise with us. And when I think about what I have heard today, I can't help thinking that the only way to tackle the global challenge of uh, moving towards a sustainable economic model mm -hmm. is by collaborating, innovating, and sharing experiences across across the, the, the Atlantic. And I'm particularly encouraged when I see how innovation in technology, but also in business models, is showing us how to tackle challenges that we didn't know how to deal with yesterday. Mm -hmm. So innovators and entrepreneurs committed to addressing issues and challenges are showing us the way. Uh, and the sector of sustainable technology is a real opportunity to do business and to change the world in the same time. We could see and hear during this inside talks that there is a vast array of opportunities to develop solutions, to improve the quality of life of people and to preserve our future. And this market is increasing very quickly and Brussels offers a very, very stimulating private and public ecosystem and regulations, as we, have, we, we heard, and which encourage and support these evolutions. Wonderful. Well, on that note, can you tell us about how Hub Brussels is actually helping companies to support the transformation of a sustainable economy? Yes, so uh, Brussels uh, is basically the, the economic development agency of the Brussels capital region. Uh, we are quite new in the landscape in Brussels. We are created uh, to provide in one single place all the support that companies need at each stage of their lives, including being the one-stop shop for all entrepreneurs or investors which want to set up or develop a company in Brussels. But our focus is on creating a modern urban economy which includes social and environmental values. We play a strong role in the economic policy choices made in Brussels. Of course, we are a governmental agency, notably stimulating the region towards a sustainable and inclusive economy that has a positive impact on the Brussels society. Thank you so much, Isabel, for sharing with us what Brussels has to offer to companies from around the world and especially in sustainable technologies. 
Thank you everyone for joining us and to all of our speakers. We would like to give a huge thank you to Hub Brussels, Brussels Economic Development Agency for hosting this experience. And don't forget, there is an ebook. Please sign up. You can subscribe and you can actually click on the link right there down below. On ne réalise pas assez comment Bruxelles était avant, hein, avec tout ce qui est la construction passive. On a déjà historiquement, entre guillemets, maintenant, des critères beaucoup plus sévères. Et maintenant, on est considéré comme une des villes qui sont plus en avant de la façon qu'on construit des nouveaux bâtiments passifs. Et je crois que Bruxelles ne doit pas être modeste dans ses ambitions. Nous avons des immeubles qui sont venus à la fin d'un premier cycle de vie. On a décidé ensemble avec un autre grand propriétaire à gérer le C de lancer Up for North avec d'autres propriétaires du quartier pour vraiment réfléchir à la transition du quartier, d'amener vraiment de la vie dans ce quartier, de partir du principe d'un quartier monofonctionnel uniquement bureau, mais vraiment de mélanger les fonctions. L'offre de Tractebel et du groupe NG en général, c'est du clé en main. Donc on intervient dès la conception jusqu'à la réalisation. On doit réfléchir non plus au niveau bâtiment, mais au niveau quartier. Vous pouvez trouver des synergies dans les profils de consommation. C'est pour ça que le prérequis pour ça, c'est des quartiers à usage mixte. Et ça, on le voit de plus en plus à Bruxelles. Du commercial, du résidentiel des bureaux et voire peut-être de l'industrie aussi. Et wanneer je iedereen van in het begin rond de tafel zet, dat je de cohérentie bewaakt, dat je de kwaliteit bewaakt, dat je sneller gaat, op die manier maak je een win-win situatie die goed is voor iedereen. Il y aura une grande partie dédiée aux bureaux, donc 70 000 carrés qui sont loués par la communauté flamande pour 18 ans à partir de 2023. Il y aura des appartements, il y aura 111 appartements sur le site, il y aura 240 chambres d'hôtel. En bas, il y aura une grande serre qui sera ouverte pour le public avec des restaurants, il y aura des commerces, il y aura aussi des facilités de sport. Le but, c'est vraiment de créer un espace public pour les habitants du quartier et pour les habitants de l'immeuble. Quand vous avez cette mixité, vous pouvez trouver justement des synergies de consommation. Un exemple très concret, les bureaux consomment plutôt la journée, alors que les personnes consomment plutôt le soir. Si vous avez des moyens de production centralisés au niveau quartier, vous pouvez réduire l'empreinte carbone de tous ces moyens euh, combinés ensemble. Wanneer men komt met een bouwvergunning en we willen een gebouw afbreken, dan moet men aantonen dat de afbraak echt nodig is en dat het geen renovatie mogelijk is. We moeten eigenlijk een soort motivatiebrief opstellen waarom men komt tot de conclusie dat een gebouw afgebroken moet worden en het dus niet kan behouden. En daarnaast natuurlijk, wanneer je afbreekt, is de bedoeling dat al het materiaal dat afgebroken wordt maximaal wordt geherbruikt. Dat is heel het opzet van de circulaire economie dat we onderschrijven en ook daar zijn we in het verleden mee begonnen en ook dat zal verder systematisch moeten gezet worden. Le tour taxi est un modèle au niveau urbanistique de par la donne qu'il y a. C'est une ancienne plateforme logistique multimodale qui a 100 ans, un peu plus, qui est extraordinaire au niveau architectural et qualité du bâti. Et donc on a la grande chance en fait de pouvoir le réaffecter. La finalité de tour et taxi, c'est de venir un quartier de ville à part entière, mais avec une identité très forte. Au niveau de l'économie circulaire, la gare maritime est l'exemple type, c'est la réutilisation d'un ancien immeuble. C'est une construction en bois, donc en, en CLT, Cross Laminated Timber, mais c'est donc entièrement démontable et réutilisable. On a essayé de garder ou de récupérer un maximum de ce qui existe aujourd'hui, donc on garde les fondations, on garde les noyaux. Au total, il y aura 95% du bâtiment existant qui sera gardé sur place, donc maintenu. 
recycler ou récupérer à plusieurs niveaux. Il y a plusieurs options de le faire. On a travaillé avec Rotor, qui est une association qui nous aide à récupérer des matériaux et faire en sorte qu'ils seront réutilisés dans d'autres projets ou pour d'autres constructions. Quand on regarde la circularité plus vers l'avenir, là on construit un immeuble très adaptable. Donc en fait, on prévoit que les fonctions qui sont prévues aujourd'hui sont interchangeables. Donc si demain nous avons besoin de moins de bureaux mais plus d'appartements, on pourra beaucoup plus facilement changer ces fonctions. Donc tout est beaucoup plus flexible, beaucoup plus modulable. Au niveau des immeubles de bureaux, nous avons déjà construit deux immeubles exemplaires au niveau écologique. Logique pour le siège de, de, de Bruxelles Environnement. On a poursuivi avec la communauté flamande qui a son centre administratif dans le bâtiment Hermann Terlink, qui est euh, sans doute un des plus grands immeubles d'énergie passive euh, en Europe. Nous, nous voulons nous intégrer notamment dans le projet que nous avons de Rovrenbeek, dans les grands projets d'innovation sur les batteries qui sont lancés au niveau européen. Les produits que nous fabriquons permettent d'améliorer les performances de ces batteries. La région bruxelloise, excellemment bien située sur le plan des communications, très accessible. Nous sommes une entreprise internationale, proximité de l'aéroport, réseau routier très favorable, siège des institutions européennes, beaucoup d'institutions internationales qui sont également présentes, c'est-à-dire proximité avec beaucoup de nos partenaires dans le cadre des activités que nous menons. Et enfin, Bruxelles, grâce à son réseau d'universités, plus largement euh, les villes qui l'entourent, présente une offre d'excellente qualité euh, dans les talents euh, dont, dont nous avons besoin euh, chez Solvay. Il peut s'agir d'ingénieurs, il peut s'agir de scientifiques, il peut s'agir de personnes en charge de la gestion. Nous bénéficions là d'un environnement très favorable pour le développement de nos entreprises, sans oublier bien entendu un soutien très très important des autorités de la région qui est une des conditions clés du succès dans nos projets de développement. Nous avons vraiment voulu construire un projet qu'on viendra voir de l'étranger. On a été récompensé avec le Be Exemplary Award qui a été donné par Urban Brussels et donc on est vraiment très fiers de ça. C'est vraiment là l'opportunité qu'on a d'utiliser ce site extraordinaire comme un vecteur de changement de la ville et de montrer que ce qui n'est pas évident est quand même possible. Bruxelles ne doit pas être modeste dans ses ambitions et si c'est un bon exemple, comment on peut l'exporter même à l'étranger.